Amen. All right. So I uh, want to invite you to go ahead and finish filling out your prayer cards. Our prayer team will come by and get those. We love the opportunity to pray with you, for you, anything going on. Um, and I need to announce and let you know that uh, we preemptively uh, postponed the business meeting to next week. And so uh, we didn't know with people, weather and all that stuff, uh, we didn't want to uh, have a business meeting without a quorum, which is uh, in this church, how many? As many as show up. So um, we want more people to come than a than, uh, bare handful. So anyway, next week is our, our business meeting. We've moved that uh, to after the service next week. Um, we're going to be in Philippians, and that's going to be chapter 4, and I invite you to find that in your pew Bible, uh, verses 4 through 7 and page 1166. As we do that, I want to um, share with you that this series, okay, the smaller series within the larger series, uh, Never Anxious, and, and I've been calling it that, uh, Never Anxious, and, and, and I, I get a little bit uh, concerned that with that kind of uh, language that some people who deal with anxiety, struggle with anxiety, uh, which is a lot of people, honestly, um, and, and most of us deal with it on some level from time to time, would you agree? There's a lot of people dealing with worry, anxiety, fear, etc., from time to time, if not uh, on a regular basis, that uh, I don't want people to think or fear or uh, be concerned that somehow uh, that they're in sin or that they are uh, weak or there's a problem. Uh, honestly, the issue of anxiety and the issue of uh, worry and et cetera, I think um, is, and I've said this before, I said this a couple weeks ago, and I just think it bears repeating, uh, it is an opportunity to grow spiritually, okay? It is much like uh, a pressure cooker, okay, where... Uh, you can actually affect things more quickly uh, if things are under pressure if you add heat. And so what happens with stress and anxiety is that it becomes that pressure. And if you'll add prayer to that, uh, you can see spiritual growth happen uh, very uh, quickly and powerfully in your life. Now, um, let me tell you, if I can... Uh, just a little bit about uh, my own personal experience. Uh, why I believe this strongly is because I see this in my own life, okay? Uh, I know that I'm strange, and uh, everybody knows that, but um, my experience of life is very different than uh, most people in ministry, okay? And, and most people don't get it, and I don't expect people to get it, and that's okay that they don't get it. Uh, ministry is a very, very different life uh, than what most people are dealing with. From the time uh, that I felt called to ministry at uh, age 21, 22, and, and started to, you know, get into uh, ministry situations uh, as a youth pastor and et cetera, I always felt completely inadequate, and I've never gotten over that in, in the last uh, 20 plus years. There's a sense of inadequacy. Who am I to be uh, leading people, uh, especially people uh, on something as vitally important as what concerns us eternally? Uh, I'm not smart enough. I'm not creative enough. I don't have enough uh, uh, personality. Uh, there's, I mean, there's all these struggles going into uh, that, and then you layer on top of that uh, a sense of uh, just the... Uh, uncomfortable nature that I have with, uh, I don't enjoy being in front of people. I uh, would never have wanted that for my life. I wouldn't have chosen that. If you said, oh, here's some things that you could do with your life. You could uh, get up and speak to people uh, weekly and, and multiple times a week, uh, or you could uh, never do that. Uh, I would choose never, uh, but that wasn't what God had for me. So there's that added sense of uh, fear and anxiety of having to do what I've been called to do every week, multiple times a week. Uh, on top of that, there's the urgency of the importance of what it is that I am called to declare, which is the Word of God, and to do it accurately. 
I, I feel that is uh, of the utmost importance that I'm going to stand before the Lord and I'm going to give an account and not just uh, as, as a typical ordinary uh, person standing before the Lord, but with an extra dose of accountability that he says that those who lead, right, are more accountable and subject to more severe judgment, and I carry that along with me, and then the sense of the responsibility for the entire church, that every aspect of the ministry, I feel, particularly falls on my shoulders, whether it's kids or youth or, or women or men or, or seniors or anything else that we do, I always feel like it reflects on me, and it's my problem, and I have to deal with it, and whether that's true or not is not really the issue. It's just that I feel that. And then uh, beyond that is the sense of uh, I want to and, and have a desire to share not only things that are important, but that, are, uh, that they are interesting. Uh, and so uh, that, since that's the last thing, always falls off the table. But uh, wanting to at least keep people engaged in uh, what we do all the time and just all that you can understand that would be a little bit of pressure. Um, ne never could I possibly imagine doing what I do without um, immense amount of prayer. Have to go to the Lord constantly, consistently, for long times to bring all these things to the Lord because there, I could not stand before you at any time and feel like I could have anything to say without... Uh, God bringing the peace of His Holy Spirit and His presence into my heart enable, to enable me to do any of that. And, and here's what I know, is that while my experience is very different than yours, um, you have uh, similar pressures in your life. They're different than mine, I know that, but they, they may be as much or even more so overwhelming to you um, no matter what is going on in your life, because of family, work, finances, health, and all the other things that go into just being a human person walking the earth. And we carry these things around, and they cause pressure, and they build up, and without the heat of prayer, um, that would simply crush you. It would disable you from functioning in the world. Uh, but with the power of the Holy Spirit in prayer, something, it doesn't just make you a survivor. What happens is it actually can produce in you growth and glorious things and wonderful reactions uh, between you and the Lord that are like diamonds. I, I don't believe diamonds form over millions of years. I believe that with enough pressure and enough heat, they form instantly in your life. Spiritual growth can happen quickly when you bring the pressure of your life to the Lord in prayer. Okay? I'm not even preaching yet. All right? So let's look at uh, what Philippians has to say about that because I find that it is really, really important uh, to learn, understand, and apply. And here's one last quick thing. Um, oftentimes people ask about a passage that uh, will help them with anxiety or stress or uh, worry or fear, and I'll point to this passage. I find it to be um, so amazing uh, in what it declares, but it's not an incantation. You don't just repeat it over and over and expect something magically to happen to you. Uh, this is instruction. This is God telling you, if you do this, then I will do this. This is something we have to apply and learn from and use, okay? So let's stand as we read God's Word this morning. Uh, Philippians 4, and we're picking it up in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
And Father, we uh, come to you thankfully in prayer, knowing that uh, by the blood of Jesus, our Lord, uh, we can come with full and confident access into your throne room. Uh, We can appeal to you uh, by your own grace, by your promises, Lord, knowing that you have uh, welcomed us, not only welcomed us, but invited us, Lord, to come to you with every thing that we struggle with, deal with, are worried about, Father, that you desire uh, to come and bear uh, witness to your power in every aspect, broken hearts, concern, uh, guilt over sin and brokenness, Lord, you can bring healing and peace to every aspect. You promise us a better future. You guarantee an eternal home, Lord, that is uh, beyond our ability to comprehend, Lord. We are so bound by this world and the things of this world, Lord, but you have given us a revelation of what it will be like. And one of the things that it'll be like is every tear wiped away. All the fear is gone, and we enter into eternal, joyful, glorious rest. And some people today need rest right now, a relief from the relentless um, pain and burden and stress uh, that uh, life can often produce. Lord, I pray that we would find our rest in you in your presence and in your power. And uh, Lord, give us the faith to reach out and cling to you. Grab a hold and never let go for our sake and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to recap the last uh, couple weeks and I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, the uh, I, I will try to do it uh, fairly um, briefly, if that's possible. Um, and but before we do that, I have to tell you one thing about uh, the word anxiety. That this is news to me. Okay, I, I just learned this. Um, but the the word anxiety in scripture uh, means and is defined by this one particular thing, which is seeking or promoting one's own interest. Okay, seeking or promoting one's own interest. And I find that definition to be a little bit um, hard to swallow at times. But then when I start to think about um, where anxiety comes from and, and why uh, I feel at times anxious or fearful or worried or, and just kind of stirred up, um, then I, I begin to realize, okay, this, this does make sense. I'm concerned with uh, what's happening to me, uh, what's going on in my life, how it affects me, and uh, what my expectations for that and what I want to see happen and, and what I think I deserve to happen. And uh, it just kind of folds back onto this cycle. I don't know if you've ever been in this cycle. It's kind of toxic, but it, it goes back into your own mind and worried about all the consequences and everything that could happen and how it's going to affect me and will I be able to and am I sufficient and how will that work out and just kind of gets into a process where the pressure builds and builds and you feel it in your chest. You ever feel that tightness and it's hard to breathe and I just need some relief from this, but your mind won't let you rest and and especially at night when it's dark and you're trying to go to sleep and everything just seems to compound. Anybody else? Just, yeah? And why, when you're trying to sleep, does it seem to all hit you? And then in the morning you wake up and like, why was I worried about that? It's so... But that's the issue of, of anxiety in particularly. And so there were three uh, specific responses that Philippians gives to how to deal with this type of thing, okay? And the first uh, that we talked about is rejoicing. Rejoice, uh, to rejoice is a choice, not based on your circumstance. The, the, uh, the letter here of Philippians tells us several times, and we could go into all the different 
uh, ways that it talks about it, but uh, specifically in chapter 3, it says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. No trouble for me. It's safe for you. And then in chapter 4, uh, what we had just read, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's something connected with rejoicing and safety, that there's a protection in this. And, and uh, what it seems to be is, is not circumstantial. And I, I want to remind you what was going on in Paul's life. When he wrote this, he's in jail, Right? He's in prison. When he wrote this, I think, to the Philippians, he's reminded of what happened in Philippi when he was there, which was that he was beaten, tossed into a jail cell without being treated or cleaned up at all in an inner cell, a dungeon, a stinky, dark, dirty hole, filthy himself, bloody and uh, in pain, thinking about, can you imagine, thinking about his ministry in Philippi. He's had a great ministry. Some people have come to the Lord. They're building a church, and now he's all of a sudden, he's an outcast. People hate him. He's been uh, ridiculed, beaten, and thrown into jail. And all the stigma of being in jail is the same back then as it is now. Disrespected, undeservedly, and... Uh, possibly his ministry's over, maybe his life is over. He doesn't know, right? So circumstantially, does he have an occasion to praise the Lord? Anybody? You say, if this was you, would you be, oh, thank you, Jesus? Or would you be, what, why is this happening to me? I don't understand. And I, okay, what, what is his decision at the moment when that happens? Not based on circumstance, he chooses to rejoice. Praise the Lord, worship the Lord, thank the Lord. And here's what happens miraculously. The bars are open, the the doors are open, the chains fall off, and an earthquake and all the rest of it, and the jailer comes to know the Lord. And here's what happens when a, a Christian person... I know I sound like a broken record. I've said this so many times. I'm trying to impress this on myself (laughs) and you. Um, When normal circumstances, these are normal things, okay? Pain, trials, struggles, uh, difficulties. That's normal. Every one of us deal with that, uh, if not consistently, at least from time to time. Would you agree? Normal circumstances with an abnormal, a supernatural response, which is praise the Lord, thank the Lord, worship the Lord, give Him glory. What happens when we rejoice in these types of circumstances is that miraculous things happen under that pressure. You add the heat of praise and prayer and things begin to change because other people see in you something different that is extraordinary and it is beautiful, and it is something that compels people to say, that's what a Christian ought to be. That's what it looks like. That's what I want. And so the jailer comes to know Christ, and miracles begin to happen. Paul leaves basically the next day without ever going back that we know of. But the church is still formed, and he's writing to them, and they're strong, and they're healthy, And by the grace of God, he was able to do a wonderful thing there. Amen? It's because the example is so mind-bogglingly different than what the world would expect. And that's something that is not... It is not something that is uh, relegated to just Paul. We can all have this. We can all choose this. We can all do this. Uh, I'm trying to be brief. Okay, so the next (laughs) thing is humility. Um, We looked at Philippians chapter 2, extraordinary humility of Christ, but he says that our attitude should be the same as his. So the first thing is that in order to get our minds off of ourselves, we rejoice and we put our minds on the Lord. Second thing is in humility, Jesus Christ, who never, in my understanding of who he was and how he lived, never undervalued who he was. 
never uh, disagreed with God that he was the son of God, never came to a point where he thought he was worthless. He knew his worth. He knew who he was from the time of at least we know of 12 years old. He's in the temple in his father's house declaring that he is the son of God. So we could imagine that he knew that before that too. We don't know. But we know from at least 12 years old and on, he knew he was the Son of God. When Satan came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, he doesn't bat an eyelash at that. He knows he's the Son of God. He never underestimates his worth and value. Okay? And I say that because sometimes humility uh, to us seems like uh, we're supposed to say, I'm worthless, I'm pitiful, I'm sinful, I'm terrible, and that's not humility. That's false humility, and that does not help you because it doesn't, number one, it's not true. You are valuable in God's eyes. He made you in His image. He loves you enough to die for you. That's your worth. Never forget that. Don't ever choose to believe differently because that's what Satan would like you to believe. In humility, we don't undervalue ourselves. We know that I have worth and value to add to other people to the world and to the circles that I find myself in. But what humility does is it also transfers that knowledge to other people. They're valuable too. No matter how they treat me, no matter what's going on in their life and how ugly they may have been to me and how I may have felt betrayed or the expectation of how I should be talked to how I should be uh, dealt with, I put that aside and I say, whatever's going on with them, they're they're a person that God still loves and values. They're not my enemy, even if they may be uh, attacking me. (laughs) You ever been attacked? So hard. This is why it's intentional. Humility has to be intentional. You have to wrestle your mind away from the thoughts of that's an evil person, they're a bad person, there's just something wrong with them, and come to the point where uh, I try to understand them, and I try to have compassion for them, and I pray for them, and whatever they're struggling with, uh, I'm going to pray for God to work in and through that to bring them to the point where they can come to know the Lord the way that I know the Lord so that they can have the peace that I have. And it's the humility of getting myself off of me and onto a caring for other people. Miraculous. It would be very different, wouldn't it? If we all did that, how much more peace and joy and productivity would we have in the church, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our families? It would be awesome. Our problem is that we're so often um, anxious, which is I'm promoting my self-interest instead of How do I bless somebody else and care for them? Okay, being brief, this is recap. (laughs) So we're intentionally praising God, rejoicing. We're intentionally, um, positively thinking about other people, humility, uh, because that's what Christ did. And then thirdly, we're intentionally praying. So we go back to our scripture here. Let's go to Philippians 4, starting in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Okay, we got that. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. Reasonableness. Um, here's what unreasoning people do, is that they only think about things from their perspective. Makes them very unreasonable. You ever dealt with somebody who's unreasonable? They will not agree with you. They will not understand you. They will not even try to see things from your perspective. It's my way, and this is how I think of it, and I was raised this way, and this is how it is, and we're going to do it my way. And there's no compromise. There's no disagreeing. There's just unreasonable. So reasonableness is a powerful thing because what it is is I have a perspective, And it's a valuable perspective. You have a perspective. It's a valuable perspective. Um, And we're going to come to a place where we can understand each other and perhaps compromise, agree, and have some kind of harmony so that we're not just unreasonably expecting everybody to do everything our way. Okay. 
Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone that considers people. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, uh, which surpasses under all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's four avenues of prayer. Okay, I'm not going to say there are four kinds of prayer. There's just four ways that prayer affects uh, your anxiousness here, okay? Uh, let me just outline these briefly. Um, first one is uh, just simple prayer, communion with the Lord, talking to God. This is just uh, how do I access uh, my relationship with the Lord? Um, how do you do that? How do you start? How do you uh, get quiet, get away from the things of the world, the family, the stresses, the the distractions, and just quietly get to a place where you can just talk to God. This is just simple prayer. It's a basic level. Um, it's powerful. Even just in this communion with the Lord, fellowship with the Lord, um, it, it can in itself cause a great deal of peace that I'm just going to dwell in the Lord's presence. And for me, uh, a lot of times I just I'll start saying, you know, I love you, Lord, and I'll start to thank the Lord for things in my life and praising the Lord for who He is. And I, I don't like, then you don't care what I like or don't like, but I, I don't like formulas. Uh, I don't like, like, here, do this checklist. I, uh, I think um, that Jesus died for us to have a personal relationship with the Lord. And I believe that God wants us just to come into His presence and uh, rest in His presence, and know Him, and be known by Him, and just just talk to Him openly uh, as our Father. He's given us the access through Jesus Christ. We have confidence that I'm not condemned in His presence, that he, He's already washed me clean, made me pure, and I can come, and I obviously have to repent of sin, and, and we know that, and I'm bringing that to the Lord, but I'm coming to the Lord knowing that He loves and accepts me, and I just I want to talk to, to my Father. Just here I am, and uh, presenting yourself to the Lord and talking to Him openly, uh, prayer. Just and you do that, and you just begin to thank Him, and and you begin to just give Him the burdens of your heart and just lay them out. And we're not even into some other aspects of prayer at this point. We're just we're just talking to the Lord, and it's powerful in and of itself. It's infused with thankfulness. And, and if I could say, before we come back to the supplication part, um, if I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but if you would try this, I've tried this before, to spend time uh, in prayer just thanking the Lord and try to exhaust that list. Just, just try it. Um, I've spent hours, literally, praying, just being thankful and just trying to exhaust everything I could possibly be thankful for, and I could not come to the end of my list. Couldn't do it. Um, eventually, I just had to say, <laughs> and all the rest, Lord, thank you. Just at some point, I mean, give that a try, because you, you might not know where to start. Start with, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. All the things that that provides, and everything that I have hope for in heaven, and I mean, you just begin to recount all the ways that God has been good to you. That in and of itself, when I was overwhelmed with fear, the Bible talks about this, when I was overwhelmed with fear, I remembered your goodness. And there's something powerful about just recounting your personal experiences with the Lord, how He was faithful, what He has done, how He's been good to you, and just recounting that, and it alleviates the pressure and the burden and the fear and the anxiety of the things that are causing pressure right now. It just It's a powerful thing. But then we bring supplication. Supplication is when I bring my needs to the Lord. A supplicant is somebody who brings their, their need um, and so what happens here is that we begin to say to God that uh, there are things. Tell me this. Are there questions that you have about situations in your life that you do not know the answer to? You're not sure what to do with. A relationship that I'm not sure how to manage that. Um, a, a 
dilemma, a choice that you need to make. You're not sure what the right choice is. You're, you're on the fence. You could go one way or another. You're just, okay. Uh, what happens when we supplicate is that uh, we don't have the answers. We're not requesting anything yet. We're just coming to the Lord with um, the concern, with the need. And most, I'm going to tell you, most of my prayer um, is this. It's just wrestling with the Lord, uh, thinking through, praying through, meditating on uh, the things that are going on, the struggles and the burdens and the questions and the concerns and just bringing those to the Lord. I don't know the answer. Uh, that's why I'm praying. <laughs> just bringing that to, the, to God. And, and what happens, though, um, and I'm going to say uh, I'm in this way, like most people, the things that hurt me the most uh, make me the most anxious are broken relationships. Uh, when, when there's conflict, when I have somebody who uh, doesn't like me, which is always, um, <laughs> then these are the things that, that really um, cause me the most stress. I can't stop thinking about them. I can't stop wrestling with it. And I bring those things to the Lord. And I have to because otherwise it would drive me crazy. Anybody else? Like, it's just... I don't know here, God, what to do. I'm not sure. And there's this thing happening, this person. And, and so what happens when you begin to just lay that out before the Lord, um, if you'll humbly do this, is you begin to remember, because God will bring it to your mind, um, things about that person, um, where they are coming from, uh, something of their past, things that you've known and learned, you just maybe forgot or dismissed. Uh, things that make them act the way that they do and, and reasons why they behave this way and, and, and causes. And you begin to have a, a fuller picture of compassion for the other person instead of villainizing and demonizing people and just putting them out and say, well, they're just bad and I just wish they would die. <laughs> Sometimes you feel that way, but <laughs> in prayer, you come back full circle to here's a person that I can begin to understand through the help and the Holy Spirit and the power of God and His wisdom. And I begin to now have the ability to intercede for them spiritually and pray for them compassionately and say, God, um, I'm glad that I don't have the kind of things going on in my life that they have in their life. I don't know how I would handle it. Maybe I would act the same way that they're acting. And so I'm going to lift them up to you and pray for your work to be done in their life. And uh, whatever you want me to do, God, would you give me the ability to do that, right? I mean, supplication, uh, especially when it incorporates people in your life that you're struggling with, can be a powerful tool to remove anxiety and especially unforgiveness and bitterness and anger towards people that uh, have legitimately hurt us. We're not saying that that doesn't happen. It does happen, but supplication says, I can grasp better that this person is still somebody that I need to love, and that you love, and I want to get your perspective on that. Second thing that happens with supplication is that uh, you begin to, and this is just a miracle, <laughs> you begin to, in your um, outlining things with the Lord, um, magnify God and your problems are minimized. You ever have that happen? You're just laying out a problem, a situation, a burden, a fear or worry, and God just kind of shrinks that down and you're like, oh, why was I worried about that? <laughs> it's just amazing how that can happen. Um, sometimes you get an answer, just God. This happens to me a lot. I'm just praying over a situation or a decision, and God will just give me tunnel vision like this is the path, wisdom and direction from the Lord. If you're not, sometimes I worry about like saying things like that because I wonder if people you know, can grasp, but honestly, if you're not seeking wisdom and direction from the Lord, what are you praying about? I mean, isn't that what God wants to do is direct your path and your steps and your next decision and how you're going to proceed? Isn't that what he wants to do? 
So often, and I get into the same struggle, uh, I'm doing what I think is best instead of praying fervently, consistently over things and allowing God to give me that path. And when I'm off on my own doing my own thing, guess what? I'm, I'm on dangerous ground. When I'm on the path that God has for me, even if it's difficult, uh, I'm safe because I'm in His will. Last thing um, is the request. I, a lot of times, um, I'll be honest, I don't even get to the request. God has worked out so many of the issues that I'm dealing with through the supplication and just the fellowship that um, there's very little that I feel like I need to just, God, would you please do this? Um, but there are uh, many times when there, I come to the end of a lot of the other things that I'm praying about, and I'm just like, God, would you, would you please, would you step in? Would you do this? Would you miraculously, would you heal? Would you, f-? and uh, just requesting. I'm, I'm going to tell you, personal, you know, issue here, um, take it or leave it, but uh, I don't think there's a lot of room to presume my will on God. It's not my will. I may have a request, and I do that humbly. I say, God, this is what I, I would ask. Uh, I can firmly and um, confidently depend on what God has promised. So if He says, if you do this, I will do this, and I'll take that as a promise, and I will guarantee. He says, resist the devil. What's the rest of it? And he will flee from you. I, I don't have to wonder, oh, God, would you please remove the devil? No, he's, uh, He will, okay? This is a guarantee. This is a promise. So the promises of Scripture... Don't question, but when it's something I'm not sure of and it's my desire, and I bring that to the Lord humbly, and I just say, God, I don't know, but I'm, I'm just requesting, would you? And I leave that with the Lord, and His will be done, and I'm going to um, roll with whatever He decides. I think we're in good company. Paul says the same thing. He's, he's like, I requested that God remove uh, the the thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. I requested three times that God do that. He didn't presume that he just was going to have this authority and power to remove this. He said, I have requested. And God said, my grace is what? Sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And this is where I come back to um, anxiety, uh, fear, and worry, and those things that creep in. They're an opportunity that should always remind us to bring the heat of prayer to those things so that we can see spiritual growth. And sometimes I really resent in myself um, those feelings. I don't like them. I want them gone. Um, But it pushes me to pray. It compels me to be in the Lord's presence. And so in that sense, uh, I wouldn't want to not have those things. Because I know myself that I could be lazy, comfortable, on my own, never thinking that I need to go to the Lord because everything seems to be working out okay. And God wants me in His presence, bringing those things to Him consistently. And so I count them as a blessing because it compels me to be in my prayer time. So here's what happens. This is the guarantee. He says that if you will, okay, this is not read this passage and speak it out loud five times and you'll be okay. He says, if you will pray, if you will request, if you will supplicate, if you will be thankful, if you will come to me, um, this is what's going to happen. He says that the peace of God, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I have not failed to find peace if I will stay with the Lord long enough in prayer. I'm not saying that it's impossible that somebody would pray, 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 and still not find that peace. I think the failure is on our part, not on God's part. He says, stay with me, pray with me, continue in prayer, and I will provide a peace that you cannot understand. It's not because your circumstances are great. It's because I will supernaturally cover you, and I will guard you, and I'll protect you from... Here's the outline of peace 
as it is uh, used in Scripture, uh, exempt from war. Wouldn't you like to be exempt from war? Just, I don't have to fight that. Here's what I love about that. Um, God says he will fight for us. He says, uh, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I don't have to take revenge. I don't have to get angry at people. I don't have to try to, you know, defend myself. God will take care of it. I'm exempt because I've given it to him. Harmony between people. That's another way of understanding peace. Just we understand each other. We're together. We agree. Harmony between people. Security, safety, rest, tranquil state of the soul, assurance of salvation, and content with life. Just any one of those things would be an awesome blessing of the, the Holy Spirit in your life. You take all those things together, and what happens is that the, the guarding of your heart and your mind, what, what does that mean? It means your feelings and your thoughts. These are the avenues that Satan would love to uh, get at you through, how you feel, how you think, and Jesus is going to stand guard against your enemy for you as you have laid these things out before the Lord, he says, I'm with you. And so here is where we become more than conquerors in Christ. You remember what I have said before about more than conquerors? A conqueror is somebody who takes something that wasn't theirs. More than a conqueror is I'm a rightful owner. Undisputed. I belong to Christ. He belongs to me. I'm his child. Uh, he says that if you believe in me, then God has given you the right to become a child of God. Um, it's my nature. It's where I stand and where I live, and this is where I belong, right? Peaceful, guarded, protected, powerful, worthy because of Christ in me, the hope of glory. Amen? Father, we love you and thank you that you guard us so powerfully. You call us into your presence. Declare to us, Lord, that uh, we are your children, that we belong to you, with you. Um, this is our rightful place. We don't have to wonder, question, be concerned about that, Lord. We simply claim that by faith. We know it's guaranteed by Christ. We know that it is uh, secured by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we just we want to anchor our lives on the truth of your word, not on our feelings, Lord. Protect us from that. Protect us from thoughts that wander, from hearts that are led astray easily, Lord. Guard us. Keep us safe and secure in your will, in your presence, in your power. And Lord, we pray that as we uh, live there, the world would see a difference. They would see something of worth and of value that they want. And help us to hold out the keys of life, the message of the truth of Jesus Christ to other people um, for their sake for your glory. And we thank you, Lord, in advance for all that you want to do and all that you will do in and through us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to invite you this morning, come to the altar. Any burden that has been too heavy for you, that you need to add the fire of prayer to, to see spiritual growth happen, come and lay it down and just let God do a mighty work. Amen.